The year is 8500 BC. The last great ice sheet has retreated. A small boat, likely hide on frame, scrapes onto a gravel beach on the Isle of Islay. The people who step ashore are the first permanent human presence in this land. They hunt, they fish, they leave behind small, precisely napped flints. For millennia, these stones were the only evidence. The people themselves dissolved into the acidic soil. Archaeology recorded them as a footnote, a genetic dead end erased by the farmers who would come 4,000 years later. But the human genome holds a more detailed record, and the data retrieved from it suggests this first lineage was not erased. It was simply submerged. 14,000 years ago, this land was silent. It was covered by the last great ice sheet, a sterile Arctic world. As the climate warmed, the ice began a slow, grinding retreat. It exposed a new landscape, raw rock, glacial gravel, and low tundra. Life followed the thaw. First, lichen and hardy grasses, then herds of reindeer, and following the herds, small bands of humans. At a site near Hoburn, archaeologists found the first human evidence, small worked flint tools. The style is known as late glacial, dated to approximately 12,000 BC. These were not settlers. They appear to have been transient hunters, moving through a land that was not yet Scotland. Their presence was brief. The ice advanced one last time in a cold period called the Younger Dryas. The hunters vanished. The true arrival came later, around 8,500 BC after the final thaw. The land was now birch forest and rich coastline. At Cramond, on the fourth estuary, fragments of burnt hazelnut shells were found. They mark a campsite. On the Western Isles, like Islay and Rum, small stone blades, microliths, appear in the soil. These were the first permanent people, the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. They stayed for four millennia. Yet, they left no graves. The acidic soil of the new forests dissolved all bone, all wood, all hide. For generations, archaeology could see their tools, but never the people themselves. They existed only as stone shadows in the earth. For 4,000 years, the Mesolithic culture endured. The climate was stable, the population was small, but around 4,000 BC, the data signature of the land begins to change profoundly. Scientists analyze pollen trapped in layers of ancient sediment. They see a sudden, sharp decline. The pollen from elm, oak, and birch trees plummets. In its place, the pollen of cereals and grassland weeds explodes. This is the footprint of agriculture. It was not an invention, but an import. This new way of life was brought by a new people. They arrived by sea their genetic origins tracing back to Anatolia in modern-day Turkey. Unlike the Mesolithic hunters, these Neolithic people left monumental evidence. They built communal tombs from massive stones. And in these chambered cairns, they left their dead. Ancient DNA retrieved from these bones tells a stark story. The Mesolithic lineage, which had dominated the land for millennia, almost completely vanishes. Studies suggest a replacement of over 90%. The hunter-gatherer genome was not assimilated. It was overwritten. These farmers built the first permanent houses in stone at sites like the Kanap of Hauer and Skara Bray. They divided the land. They marked the sky. They were the first people to impose their will upon the landscape. They were building a new world on top of the old. Around 2500 BC, the stone-building Neolithic culture began to fade. A new set of artifacts appears in the archaeological record. These include distinctive bell-shaped pottery vessels known as beakers. With them came new materials, the first copper daggers, then the knowledge of bronze. A new ideology arrived, too. The massive communal chambered tombs were abandoned. People were now buried individually in small stone graves called cysts accompanied by these beaker pots. For decades, this was seen as cultural diffusion, a new trend adopted by the existing farmers. 
The genetic data, however, revealed a different truth. The beaker phenomenon was carried by a third wave of migrants. These new people originated on the vast Pontic steppe, north of the Black Sea. Their arrival was swift, and the demographic impact was total. In 2016, the genome of Ava, a woman who died around 4,250 years ago near Akavanich, provided a clear picture. She was an early descendant of these steppe migrants. Her DNA showed that this new population replaced approximately 90% of the Neolithic gene pool, the people who had built Skara Bray and Kalanish. This migration introduced the Y-DNA haplogroup R1b, which today is carried by the majority of Scottish men. The world of the communal megalith builders had been erased. A new Metal Age hierarchy had taken its place. The Bronze Age cooled into an age of iron. Across the north, a new architecture of defense emerged. On prominent hills, massive earth and stone ramparts were raised. And in the far north and west, the most sophisticated structures of the British Iron Age appeared. The Brocks. These were tall, complex, dry stone towers built for reasons that are still debated. The people who built them were the descendants of the Beaker migrants. Genetically, they were a fusion of the dominant steppe migrant DNA with a small persistent trace of the Neolithic farmers they had replaced. They were not one kingdom, but hundreds of small territories. The name that history would remember came from outside. In 83 AD, the Roman Empire pushed north. The governor, Agricola, marched his legions into the forests. The Roman historian Tacitus recorded the campaign. He gave these tribes a collective name, the Caledoni. He described them as fierce, red-haired, and large-limbed. Rome could not hold this land. The frontier was pulled back. The people beyond it remained unconquered, but they were now defined by their opposition to the empire. Later Roman writers used a new collective term, Picti, the painted ones. They left no written text, only these powerful enigmatic symbols carved into standing stones. Their precise meaning remains unknown. After Rome's withdrawal, the land fractured. The historical record written by monks describes a new and complex political geography. Four distinct peoples appeared to share the land that would become Scotland. In the north and east, the descendants of the Iron Age Picti held sway. In the southwest, the kingdom of Strathclyde was home to the Britons, who spoke a language related to modern Welsh. In the southeast, the Angles, a Germanic people, had pushed north, establishing the powerful kingdom of Northumbria. Then, a fourth group arrived. From the north of Ireland, a Gaelic-speaking people known as the Scoti crossed the sea. They settled in Argyle, establishing the kingdom of Dalriata. They brought with them a new language, Gaelic, and from their monastery on the island of Iona, they brought a new faith, Christianity. For centuries, this was the accepted origin story. Four peoples competing for dominance. Yet modern genetic analysis complicates this tidy narrative. Ancient DNA suggests the Picts, the Britons, and the invading Scoti were already genetically very similar, all drawing from the same deep Bronze Age beaker ancestry. The Angles were the only group with a clearly distinct new Germanic signature. The divisions were real, but they were primarily political and cultural, not genetic. The making of Alba, the future kingdom of Scotland, was a process of political fusion, not a war between alien tribes. This fragile balance was about to be broken. In 793 AD, the chronicle entries turned dark. Raiders from Scandinavia arrived. The monastery at Iona, the heart of Gaelic Christianity, was plundered. This was the beginning of the Viking Age. At first, it was swift, violent raiding. But soon, it became conquest, and then settlement. Nowhere was this impact more profound than in the Northern Isles. 
The Pictish culture that had existed in Orkney and Shetland was almost completely erased. The language, the symbol stones, the entire way of life vanished. It was replaced by a new Norse world. Modern genetic data confirms this replacement. Why DNA studies in Orkney and Shetland show that 25 to 40 percent of the male lineage is of direct Norse origin. This was not a small mixing, it was a demographic takeover. In the West, in the Hebrides, the impact was also significant, but it was more of an assimilation. A new hybrid culture emerged, the Norse Gaels. This intense external pressure had an unintended consequence. Faced with Viking attacks from the East and Norse Gael power in the West, the two remaining great kingdoms were forced together. Around 843 AD, the Pictish king, Kenneth MacAlpin, also became king of the Gaels of Dalriata. A new unified kingdom was formed. It was called Alba. The violence from the sea had inadvertently catalyzed the birth of a nation. Today, the genome of modern Scotland holds all these previous layers. It is a record, written in DNA, of every migration, every replacement, and every assimilation. Genetic surveys, like the People of the British Isles project, allow this deep history to be mapped with precision. The data reveals there is no single Scottish gene. Instead, the population is a complex mosaic. In Orkney and Shetland, the Norse genetic signature remains powerful, a clear echo of the Viking settlements. In the borders, genetic affinities point south to the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria. In Argyll and the west, the links are strongest to the north of Ireland, the homeland of the Scoti. And beneath all these more recent layers, the deep foundational DNA of the Bronze Age Beaker people provides the common bedrock for almost everyone, even the first faint lineage of the Mesolithic hunters, once thought erased, is now thought to persist. A tiny genetic trace submerged, but not entirely lost. The land was never empty. It was simply waiting. The modern population is not one people, but the sum of all of them. The genetic story of Scotland is one of constant inevitable accumulation.